Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back uh, to the 11th um, Symposio Caribe Plurilingue. Uh, we have our next panel of speakers ready to speak. Our next presentation is by Itza Hernandez Giovannetti, and she will be speaking on Spanglish in Puerto Rico, a step forward. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to see you're all here today. Thank you for coming. And like Dr. Faraclas mentioned, my name is Itza, and I'm going to be talking about Spanglish in Puerto Rico. Okay? When we talk about Spanglish, we're referring to that combination of English and Spanish, maybe talking half in one language, half in another. Okay? In our context, we're going to be talking about mostly English and Spanish. But remember, this applies to pretty much any combination of languages, and it could be even more than two languages. Okay? So. I bet you everybody has met at least one person who cringes at the idea of mixing two languages, right? So that is because they adhere to something called monolingual ideologies, okay? To give you a more concrete definition, it is the notion that communication is only efficient and successful when using a single common language with shared norms that are stipulated by native speakers of such language, okay? So it's basically the idea that there is only one correct way to speak the language, and each language is tied to identity and community. So this is where the idea of one language, one community, one identity comes from, OK? And initially, it may not sound all that bad, right? But it is kind of problematic, and I'll tell you why. It's because it, it only considers one variation of the language. So there is only one correct way of speaking the language according to these ideologies, OK? Anything that is different from the norm is considered deficient, OK? It also fosters the idea that we're supposed to be incompetent or inauthentic in languages of other communities. So we can only be born into one community, which means we can only be, be good at one language, OK? But what happens if you speak more than one language, OK? Let's see. Traditional bilingualism was viewed as viewed bilinguals as two monolinguals in one. That's why we have over there at the top those two separate squares. Okay, we have all the linguistic features from one language stored in one part of the brain, part of the brain. I'm sorry, what and all the linguistic features of the other language stored in another part of the brain. That was according to traditional uh, bilingualism. But then we had this guy, this scholar called Jim Cummings, and he was like, No, I think that's not correct. I think those two languages might interact. They do have a common underlying proficiency, but they're still kept separate in the brain. Okay, that, that was um, progress, okay? But now we have something a little bit more modern called translanguaging. And that is the last square over there at the bottom, where you can see that all the linguistic features of all of your languages are stored in the same part of your brain, okay? So this is kind of like the understanding we have now of bilingualism. To give you a more concrete definition of translanguaging, it's the process of making meaning, shaping experiences, and gaining understanding and knowledge through the use of our entire linguistic repertoire. So basically, using all the languages that we know to make sense of the world, okay? And it assumes that bilinguals have one complex linguistic repertoire from which they select features that are socially appropriate. So you can have more than one language, you can just you usually have them all stored together in that little drawer in your brain for languages all together and you just pick whichever features are pertinent to the situation so if you feel like you're in a situation where you can only use Spanish you get your uh, Spanish from that drawer if you feel like you can use English you only get your English from that drawer if you feel like you can use both languages at the same time you could just use both of them at the same time okay and translanguaging is more like an umbrella term, okay? We're mostly familiar with code switching. That's the most common form of translanguaging we usually tend to hear about around. But there are other ways of to translanguage. Some of these include conversations when one, pe one person speaks one language, the other person speaks another language, conversations about a text in one language and having the, com oh, sorry, uh, conversations in one language around a text in a different language, Basically, any situation where you would have more than one language interact. It doesn't necessarily have to be two. It can be more than two. It doesn't necessarily have to be Spanish and English. It could be any combination, okay? So based on this, I wanted to find out or get a better idea of how Puerto Rican university students perceive the use of English and Spanish on, in Puerto Rico. And I actually went on to Confesiones UPRRP. I hope you're all familiar with this page, right? It's a Facebook page where people post anonymous uh, messages about pretty much anything, right? You can find the weirdest things on there. But I went and looked spe specifically for examples of 
how monolingual ideologies are manifest themselves in Rio Piedras, in our community, right? So I have a translation of this message over here. It says, please stop speaking half in English and half in Spanish. This mental mess in which many people think and want to normalize is causing severe damage in Puerto Rican culture. If you think you're a gringo, move to Gringolandia. These hipsterias are, are what are screwing up Puerto Rico, okay? So... Let's break down this example over here. First of all, we can see a lot of signs that this person adheres to monolingual ideologies. They, the, for example, the please in caps, they're basically screaming at the people like, please stop. It shows the desperation they have to make others stop this linguistic practice, okay? Uh, they also point out code switching as a mental mess, which implies that people who code switch have no way of deciding when they're gonna do it and when they're not. So, it's like they have no control, okay? Um, he also points, or they, I, we don't know if it's a male or a female, they normalize these, they say that people want to normalize these practices. So they're implying that it's not normal then to mix languages and use all of your languages to make sense of the world, okay? And they also say that this is damaging Puerto Rican culture, as if code switching and using all your languages was, would make you less Puerto Rican, okay? That's what they're saying, okay? But then, if we look at how they, uh, deliver their message, right? We see that they also engage in these same linguistic practices that they're criticizing because they use the word hipsteria. I don't know if you know, but it's not, that's not a word that's approved by the Real Academia de la Lengua Española, right? Because it's a word that comes from English, hipster. They just added the Spanish suffix eria and made hipsteria, right? And if they really were, if they really believed in those monolingual ideologies they're preaching for, they probably wouldn't have made this choice, okay? Another interesting, I went back there, another interesting thing to point out is that in the original one, in the original Spanish version, they say Guille de Gringo, but they don't use Gringo or Gringa, they use Gring X, right? Also something that is not approved by the Real Academia de la Lengua, which should damage Puerto Rican culture if we were adhering to monolingual ideologies, okay? But not everybody thinks this way, so I have another more positive example. This one is a bilingual literary magazine that was published here in Tio Piedras, okay? I'm gonna read you a portion of the introduction that I translated, it says, this has been a result of the joint effort of the humanities and general studies faculty in order to promote the uprising of Spanglish in our Rio Piedras campus, okay? So first of all, they're referring to Spanglish as a language, okay? I found that super interesting. And the main goal of this literary magazine was to promote the use of Spanglish in Puerto Rico, okay? They promote bilingualism, by doing this, they promote bilingualism and, as the norm. And just the fact that it's a literary magazine, you know, it's published, it's in writing, it really perpetuates the fact that they wanted to translanguage. It was their intention to publish works that were some only in Spanish, some only in English, some were a combination of the two, okay? And even the actual structure of the magazine, Translanguages, because they have the introduction written in Spanish and the prologue in English, okay? So you can just find English and Spanish all over the place in that magazine. And that was their purpose, okay? And this magazine published works from students from all over the island. It wasn't just from Area Metro, you know? Rio Piedras has students from all over the place. So we have their... The magazine has little biographies of the students who published in this magazine, and we had people from Arecibo, from Ponce, from Mayagüez, from pretty much all over the island, which, evidences, which is evidence that, yeah, Spanglish has happened pretty much all over the place in Puerto Rico. So back to my original question. Is Spanglish a step forward? I would say definitely yes. Why? Because when we use all of our linguistic repertoire. We're fighting this idea that you can only be good at one language and you can only be proficient at the, your mother tongue, okay? And it's not about having one language over the other. It's about having languages on the same step, okay? When we see monolingualism as the norm, it becomes really hard to accept the way that we use language, right? So we try, you should stay away from replicating these colonial ideas that are built on artificial boundaries of where you can't use a language and where you can use a specific language, a specific language, okay? So I am sharing this with you because change starts with one person, with yourself. So it's, it's up to you to change these monolingual ideologies that a lot of people believe in, okay? So change starts with ourselves. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, 
Our next speaker uh, is Anna Tubens Perez, and she'll be uh, presenting. on languagelessness and bicultural ambivalence in Puerto Rico. Okay, let's see if we can get this back again. One minute, sorry about that. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to begin my presentation by reading a section of a poem titled My Graduation Speech by renowned New Yorican poet Tato Laviera that says, Tengo las venas aculturadas. Escribo en Spanglish, Abraham, Abraham in Espanol, Abraham in English, Tato in Spanish, Tato in English, Tonto in both languages. Here we have an example of a man constrained by traditional ideologies of language and culture. A man who is constrained by the phenomena that I studied, which are languagelessness and bicultural ambivalence. Let's start with languagelessness. What is that? Languagelessness are ideologies that claim that a person's linguistic capacity is limited because they use two languages at the same time. In our case, we use English and we use Spanish, and there's an understanding that we don't master either one, and so we don't have a language. A person's inability to produce any language legitimately or tolerably because their level of proficiency is considered incomplete by standards of outsiders. The effect of this phenomena is that it prevents people from being perceived as legitimate language users, which we will see um, in the next slides. But first, I want to talk about whether this concept is new. Although languagelessness has appeared very recently in racial linguistics through the, the studies of Jonathan Rosa and Nelson Flores, it's really not a new term. We have from, the, from 1979 the term semilingual, we have the term limited bilingual, alingual, and non-nons. All of these terms by different um, theorists who say that if you have two languages, then you don't have a language. It's the idea that one plus one equals zero. On the other hand, we have bicultural ambivalence. It's more or less the same idea about having two languages and not having any, but with culture. The lack of cultural identification of students in relation to both the home and school cultures. In the Puerto Rican context, we have a lot of Puerto Ricans who have moved out of the island in the diaspora, and they, have, they feel like when they um, come back to Puerto Rico, they're treated as, they're, as if they were Americanized. But then when they're over there, they're not accepted because they're not, they haven't acculturated enough. And so they're not accepted by either of their cultures. In my study, I wanted to answer the, few, the following questions. I wanted to figure out if Puerto Ricans are perceived as languageless both by themselves and by outsiders. I wanted to answer the same question with bicultural ambivalence, and then I wanted to look at the reasons why. How did we get here? First, are Puerto Ricans perceived as languageless? Let's talk about Puerto Rican Spanish first. Latin communities and even non-Hispanic communities criticize the Puerto Rican variety of Spanish as incomplete or contaminated in comparison to their own. Throughout time, our Spanish has simply gained a very unfair reputation of not being educated. That's our Spanish, our, our first language. In the case of our English, even here in Puerto Rico, in 2013, a renowned newspaper, El Nuevo Día, published uh, an article um, with the title No Somos Bilingües, um, which we'll talk about. But that article said that our population have only 10% English proficiency. And so we are considered as languageless by um, Puerto Ricans and outsiders. Here are some of the attacks on um, um, Puerto Rican Spanish that I found online very easily. 
Um, I would like to start actually with the one in the bottom and why I think this one is so interesting is because this is from 1923. This came from a book on the history of education in Puerto Rico and this man said, another important fact that must not be overlooked is that a majority of the people of this island do not speak pure Spanish. Their language is a patois almost unintelligible to the natives of, of Barcelona and Madrid. It possesses no literature and little value as an intellectual medium. There is a bare possibility that it will be nearly as easy to educate these people out of their patois into English as it will be to educate them into the elegant tongue of Castile. So as you see, uh, in 1923, already there was an idea that our Spanish was flawed and uneducated. Then we have uh, a quote from 2013, very recently, where an outsider, this person was not uh, Puerto Rican, said, I admire this woman's ability to openly admit that Puerto Rico has the worst grammar of all the Spanish-speaking countries. Surely she could understand Spanish better than any non-native speakers, but when it came to cold-cut grammar, we had her beat. So as you can see, there's again these ideologies that our English, is, our Spanish, sorry, is illegitimate, incomplete, and uneducated. Here we have more reproductions of these same ideologies by Puerto Ricans. Like I said before, this is, um, there's an example from the, from an article where the Secretary of Education said that the Puerto Rican English teacher's accent as well as their command of the language is not the best. They know the grammar, but the spoken language is not their strong point. So here we are blaming educators and their um, lack of proficiency in the, in the knowledge. This one is from the article that I mentioned from El Nuevo Día that says, in Puerto Rico hay dos lenguas oficiales y la realidad es que no dominamos ninguna. Think about how harmful it is to reproduce these ideologies in such a popular forum as El Nuevo Día being read by members of our community thinking, I don't, there is no language that I speak well enough. Basically, we have here a group of Puerto Ricans who agonize over whether or not their English is cultivated enough. They are extremely self-conscious because every time that they are evaluated by other people, they are, they are found wanting by their standards. Standards that are not chosen by ourselves, but by members of outside communities. Now we move on to bicultural ambivalence, whether or not we are considered biculturally ambivalent. Well, on one hand, we are not considered by uh, members of the United States as being American enough. Here we have, it says, many Puerto Ricans in the diaspora, regardless of how long or how little time they have spent away from their native island, face disdain from people in the United States because their cultural patterns are not fully American. However, when they come back to the island, other Puerto Ricans also show them contempt because they have, at least at some level, actually become acculturated to the cultural patterns traditionally understood as pertaining to the United States. So just like language, the culture is considered to be contaminated or incomplete by many members of society because it borrows from cultural patterns of more than one country. Here we have examples of this in an article titled A Place to Call Home, Not Puerto Rican Enough for the Island, Not American Enough for the U.S. The author states, I don't feel I'm from the U.S. However, I've been told over and over again that I was not born on the motherland of Puerto Rico and therefore cannot claim full-blooded Puerto Rican. I find myself constantly living in a state of limbo. And this is the feeling that many Puerto Ricans have to live with, that state of limbo of, do I speak Spanish? Do I speak English? Am I bilingual? Am I Puerto Rican? Am I American? What am I? It's a very important struggle of identity. So how did we get here? A really important a factor in us being considered languageless and biculturally ambivalent is the history of English um, being implemented in our education. In 1898, after 400 years of Spanish rule over Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico became a colony of the United States and thus a process labeled as Americanization by Schmidt began. 
during that process, there were many changes in the, in the Department of Education, where first some uh, grades were in English, and then some classes, and then sometimes they kept changing it without having, ma having any studies or looking at the consequences. And so there was a, a disconnect between the policies and what the people were speaking at home. In 1949, the process of Puerto Ricanization began where Villaronga established Spanish as a medium of instruction for all grades. By 1969, English was no longer perceived as a threat. So now we're in a process called bilingualization where our parents, for example, they're okay with the idea of us learning English and even encourage us to learn this language because of professional opportunities and so on and so forth. So it's, it's no longer perceived as a threat to our Puerto Rican-ness, so to speak. And yet, we are not considered bilingual um, to this day after 120 years of English presence. What are the repercussions of these phenomena? These negative ideologies about language and culture affect our students directly as they struggle to form their identities. I talk about students because I am myself an educator, but think about how it has affected you as students. Students begin, rep begin reproducing these ideologies early on and continue to do so when they reach higher education. During my years working in the Department of Education, I had students in the fourth grade who already were walking into the classroom saying, Missy, yo no sé inglés and really not open to that opportunity. They grow up with those ideas, and then they grow up believing that they are less, and then they limit their own potential because they feel inferior to others. Unfortunately, this has real life consequences. In a study conducted, there were some consequences for teachers in the United States these teachers questioned their ability to become bilingual teachers because they had grown up thinking that their English proficiency and their Spanish proficiency was not enough. And thus, they were really concerned about teaching the right Spanish or the right English as um, decided by whoever decides these standards. What is the role of an educator? Again, I am a teacher. so. Our role as teachers is to disrupt harmful ideologies in our classrooms. So some ways to do that is to reject one-size-fits-all approaches, to use culturally relevant pedagogies, um, to see bilingualism as an asset rather than as a liability, and to understand the language varieties are not inherently bad or good. What are those culturally relevant practices that I speak of? Uh, teachers have to have high expectations of all children believing in their infinite capacity and potential. They must have a critical understanding of the monocultural nature of mainstream curricula, teaching, and assessments. They must avoid measuring the varied, rich, and sophisticated cultural, cultural practices of all, and they must encourage students to become culturally competent in their own culture as well as in at least one other culture. So in summary, to foment critical consciousness, to develop young children as active civic participants who critically breathe the injustices that characterize their lives and worlds and actively work to problematize, challenge, and change them. I would like to go back to the poem that I read in the beginning. Tato La Viera is a renowned poet, a famous poet, and yet he writes, tonto, in both languages. These ideologies need to be disrupted. And so even though I focus on educators, as community members, as Puerto Ricans, it is our job to recognize that these borders between languages and borders between cultures are inventions. And it is not only our job, but our right to go past them. Thank you very much. Okay, our next presenter is Jacqueline Zhang. She's going to be talking about Estamos Bien, Musica Contestataria, Yesterday and Today. Give a clap. Hi, everyone. Um, 
To start off with, I don't know if you guys are all familiar with De La Nada, the, the group. So they just released like a parody song of Estamos Bien. I don't know if you guys are aware. Um, I wanted to add it, but I didn't want to extend time, so you can look it up. It's really, really good. Okay, so um, Cheo Feliciano's song, Anacaona, released in 1971, is an artistic work that faces the test of time in Puerto Rican culture. Feliciano's baritone voice and the drum beats of El Tambor are beautiful distractions to the vivacity of the lyrics. Anacaona, oí tu voz, como lloró cuando gimió, Anacaona, eh, oí la voz de tu angustiado corazón, tu libertad nunca llegó. He then goes on to sing, la tribu entera la llora porque fue buena negrona. Y recordando, recordando lo que pasó, la tribu ya se enfogona. Um, I thought about singing this, but I, I will not give you the pleasure today. <laughs> Anacaona became one of the iconic songs to describe the concept of Ángel Quintero Rivera's Música Contestataria. Not only due to its retelling of the violent injustices of colonization, but also because of its breaking of the silence that the oppressor so often time forces upon the colonized throughout history. As Puerto Ricans, it is vital to fast forward to present day and question the concept of Quintero Rivera's Musica Contestataria today. After almost 50 years since the release of Feliciano's top hit, where do musicians find themselves now? Quintero Rivera's concept is a simple one, and he speaks about it in his interview with Clasco TV, where he discusses his book, Salsa, Sabor y Control, La Sociología de la Musica Tropical. Since the beginnings of the concept are formed due to the diaspora, he describes the concept as the following. La expresión de los jóvenes latinos, principalmente los jóvenes puertorriqueños en Nueva York, es claro. Están en una situación, por un lado, donde sus padres están buscando la tierra de oportunidades, pero por otro lado se encuentran un tipo de exclusión a que no estaban acostumbrados, y es una manera de expresarse en contra de eso. I think that this works well with this whole Spanglish dynamic. Um, through this definition, it is safe to say that this exclusion these Puerto Ricans feel is comparable to otherness and segregation. Anacaona is not your typical Cocolo love song like Frankie Ruiz's Tu Me Vuelves Loco or Eddie Santiago's dedication to heartbreak and lluvia. It is instead a song of lucha and libertad. Today, popular Puerto Rican musicians find themselves in similar socio-political situations as in previous years, and art has always been a way to criticize ongoing crisis through the opportunity of having a voice. In 1971, the same year Feliciano releases Anacaona, Luis Aferre was the governor of Puerto Rico, and Operation Bootstrap was still in full effect. As founding father of the Partido Nuevo Progresista, or PNP Party, Ferrer deeply believed in the statehood of La Isla de Borinquen. The early 70s were feeling the impact of Oper Operación Manos a la Obra, where agriculture was thrown to the side as the indus industrialization of Puerto Rico became a crucial goal for the United States government. By the early 1970s, there were only approximately 68,000 paid workers employed in agriculture and fishing, and 132,000 paid workers employed in manufacturer labor. Changes like these impulse the diaspora of the Puerto Rican people to better opportunities, as we see in such nationalist and influential texts as René Marquez, La Carreta, where the family of Doña Gabriela, Luis, Juanita, and Chaguito packed to move to San Juan and then to New York against the wishes of the stubborn yet passionately, passionately nationalist Don Chago, who decides to spend the rest of his days in a cave rather than go along with his family and leave his home. In today's society, we face a quite different diaspora but one equally created by the insistent, corrupt, and power-hungry ways of both the state and federal government. Hurricane Maria only brought Puerto Rico to its current situation before time, but the corruption and instability within the governing system had already been collapsing from within. 
While schools continue to close, Executive Director of La Junta de Control Fiscal, Natalie Yaresco, makes $625,000 a year, and the University of Puerto Rico undergoes new changes, spikes in enrollment prices, and a hefty interruption in their benefits, to say the least. The massive exodus of Boricuas has been more excessive than ever before. It is in this precise moment where art becomes the fuel for the voiceless to speak. Uh, yeah. Punk turned salsa band Orquesta Macabeo formed in Trujillo Alto in 2008. Their songs are a mixture of charisma with wit, as we see in songs like Supermercado, released in 2010 on their album Salsa Macabra. On November 19, 2016, the group released another album titled La Maldición del Timbal, where the group's songs get serious. The song La Maldición Colonial has the following lyrics. A mí que me entierren con dos esposas, mi atebeane, neken y mi maboya. Cuidado no te ahoguen como a Salcedo, bebiendo kusubi te olvidaremos. The singer's mention of Salcedo is clearly no coincidence. It is a threat to the colonizer with fast rhythm. The legend of Diego Salcedo and his trip to Puerto Rico in 1511 ends with his drowning at the hands of the Tainos, led by Agüevana el Bravo, leader of the rebellion against Ponce de Leon and the Spanish conquistadors at the time. The lyrics are both a take at honoring the Taino ancestors and celebrating rebellion, while also being a warning to the conqueror that is paying close attention. Another example of today's musica contestataria can be seen in, in much of René Pérez Joglar or Residente's work. It is not necessary to get into extreme detail of his work. His lyrics have been enough to cause upset in the government and to create solidarity among the Puerto Rican people. Residente's Hijos del Cañaveral is self-explanatory. Uh, quote, Nuestra raza por naturaleza es brava. Salimos de la tapa de un volcán con lava Oh, okay, this computer came with the Outlook. I don't know what to... You can keep that thought in your mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. And let's see if we're back in the... Okay, let's see if it moves. Okay. Okay, so I'll just restart that part. Um, Nuestra raza por naturaleza es brava. Salimos de la, de la tapa de un volcán con lava. No hay identidad, dicen algunos, pero aquí todos llevamos en la espalda el número 21. Aprendimos a caminar hace rato con un pie descalzo y el otro con zapato. Con la medalla del cacique en la casa de empeño, somos los dueños de un país sin dueño. His lyrics not only call for Puerto Ricans to celebrate themselves for their strength, but also to awaken nationalist reasoning within. The central mountains of Puerto Rico, better known to us as La Cordillera Central, is known for its volcanic land even though there is no active volcano. And although, as Residente states, some say we have no identity, Pérez Joglar mentions the number 21, which was baseball player and philanthropist Roberto Clemente Walker's jersey number the entire time he played with the Pittsburgh Pirates. We are a land without an owner, yet we stand on our own two feet and are not in need of a conqueror to dominate. Lastly, there is Bad Bunny. Uh, the controversy that has been in play with him, Ricardo Rosselló and the Department of Education has placed El Conejo Malo under a negative light. However, anthropologist Yarimar Bonilla states that there are more pertinent occurrences that the Puerto Rican population should be looking at instead of the successes or failures of 24-year-old Benito Antonio Martinez Ocasio. 
His most recent performance on The Tonight Show left an impression when he reproached Trump for his ineptitude concerning Hurricane Maria. Uh, he says, quote, after one year of the hurricane, there's still people without electricity in their homes. More than 3,000 people died and Trump is still in denial. But you know what? Estamos bien, right? Cono sin billetes de cien, whatever he does. I'm not like, I'm analyzing the song, but I'm not the best singer. So Bonilla writes in her column piece titles, El Conejo de Todos los Males. Estamos bien no representa un himno de escapismo, sino de resiliencia. Es el reflejo musical de la actitud de miles de personas que han puesto sus propios techos, que han alimentado sus propias comunidades y que han buscado a la manera de sobrevivir y resistir sin tener que recurrir a la migración y el exilio. His lyrics, dime qué esperas tú, uh, uh, si alguien puede eres tú, uh, aunque pa' casa no ha llegado la luz, gracias a Dios porque tengo salud, eh, eh, amén. La vida no tiene repetición después de que mami me eche la bendición. Um, I don't know if you can see the pictures that I chose. Obviously, you know about the bad gubby thing. And then this is something that uh, came out in one of the battles. It was a student that had the, the lyrics to one of his songs, La Vida Un Ciclo, Lo Que No Sirve, Yo No Lo Reciclo. And this was in refer, refer, ref, referring to uh, Rosselló. Uh, okay, so these lyrics are wholesome, and while people criticize other songs that he has performed, Bonilla makes a solid statement. What makes these songs any worse than all the terrible and violent love songs that we hear on the radio in our everyday life? Today, we are what professor and scholar Juan Flores would call a modern con colony, tangled in between legal and political violence, such as the Jones Act, while intently finding a way for the present-day Boricuas to survive under oppression, estilo, hashtag, yo no me quito. We are a, quote, people wedged in an impossible situation, end quote, just as Martinican writer and theorist Edward Glissant writes of his own people. If we are thrown up against the wall, is it not our job as a collective to fight back using any weapons possible, which would be in this case art? Musica Contestataria creates awareness to the people that listen and remind us all that as Claude McKay writes in his poem, if we must die, though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men will face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. Thank you. Okay, I would like to uh, invite uh, Michelle and Gabriela to come to the stage. Um, our next presentation is by Michelle Guzman and Gabriela Lanause Torres. Uh, it's about public discourse on food in Puerto Rico. Buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Gabriela, esta es Michelle y vamos a presentar eh, una propuesta de investigación que tenemos eh, titulada La representación mediática de la a lo, a norma alimentaria en Puerto Rico, eh, una propuesta de investigación. Pues vamos a, voy a comenzar con un poquito de trasfondo histórico. Eh, todo va a comenzar con la invasión estadounidense en 1898, cuando los americanos, los estadounidenses llegaron a Puerto Rico, ya nosotros teníamos una agricultura eh, desarrollada, pero los estadounidenses vieron una oportunidad para poder eh, explotar esta industria y comenzaron a hacer eh, inversiones privadas, eh, sobre todo para la caña de azúcar, y se fue desarrollando a lo que llamamos un one crop system, que básicamente todo, todo lo que se cultivaba en Puerto Rico era caña de azúcar. 
y pues para los americanos hubo muchas ganancias, pero para los puertorriqueños esto fue muy malo y eh, crearon mucha pobreza y Estados Unidos tuvo que crear subsidios para eh, los puertorriqueños y se, nosotros, aquí en Puerto Rico comenzó como una inquietud y muchos problemas y eh, ahora estamos en el 1948 eh, el, con Luis Muñoz Marín, que lo eligen como el primer, primer gobernador puertorriqueño, elegido por el pueblo, Luis Muñoz Marín, con eh, Teodoro Moscoso, desarrollan lo que se llama Operación Mano a la Obra, Operación Bootstrap. El fin de esta propuesta era modernizar a Puerto Rico, industrializarlo, pues básicamente creando nuevas carreteras, edificios, nuevos trabajos. Eh, para entonces... Cuando se fueron desarrollando, se dieron cuenta que no hubo suficientes trabajos para todos los puertorriqueños en la isla. Y pues se creó una migración, un desplazamiento básicamente forzado a estados como Nueva York y Chicago. El Partido Popular, para poder como acoger a estos puertorriqueños que ya no iban a estar en la isla, desarrollaron a su vez la imagen del jíbaro que pues, esta imagen de el jíbaro triste, en el campo, deprimido, que no tenía manera de superarse. Y entonces creamos estas dos imágenes, pues el jíbaro del campo, que depende de la agricultura, cómo él no se va a superar y cómo nosotros tenemos que alejarnos del campo y cómo tenemos que ir a estas industrias de la manufactura y ahí es donde van a estar los avances y ahí es donde nos vamos a poder superar a nosotros mismos. Eh, ya, no gente. Eh, también con, este, eh, con Operación Mano a la Obra crearon muchas extensiones contributivas y para todas estas compañías americanas para que puedan venir, entonces también tenían el derecho de pagarle menos a sus empleados y todos estos eran incentivos para que estas compañías vinieran y se desarrollaran en Puerto Rico, pero ya para finales de los 1960 todos estos incentivos y pues propuestas estaban eh, expirando y vemos cómo esta industria industrias salen de Puerto Rico y ya para finales de los 1960, 40% de la población que podía trabajar estaba ya desempleada de nuevo y vemos cómo se está quedando como todo este ciclo de dependencia y entonces vuelven a traer estos incentivos para las compañías americanas y están aquí un rato, se les acaban estos incentivos y vuelven a, y se van, que fue lo que ocurrió en, lo, en los 90 igualmente. Y pues vemos cómo este ciclo vicioso que ha creado una dependencia alimenticia y cómo no tenemos soberanía alimenticia y tenemos que estar dependiendo de eso de afuera siempre porque desde que se creó ese One Crop System en los 1930 ya estamos buscando casi todo nuestro alimento de afuera, importándolo. Y cómo nos hemos alejado mucho de la tierra y pensamos que no podemos pues nosotros mismos cultivar y depender y tener nuestra propia soberanía alimenticia. Ah, exacto, que no es exportación, obviamente importación de alimentos lo que produjo. Sí. Lo que, lo único que hubo de exportación pues, en los 30 era más que todo la caña de azúcar. Eh, nuestra pregunta de investigación es si influye la representación mediática de la norma alimentaria en la sostenibilidad alimentaria de Puerto Rico. Y nuestro objetivo es si influye, pues vamos a ver cómo influye esta representación mediática eh, en la norma alimentaria, de la norma alimentaria en la sostenibilidad alimentaria de Puerto Rico. Pues nuestro marco teórico es el análisis crítico del discurso que se enfoca en la producción y reproducción del poder, la dominación y la inequidad social a través del discurso. Entonces, el discurso puede ser hablado o puede ser escrito. Entonces, hay dos maneras, según Van Dyke, que hay dos maneras de ejercer control. La primera de ellas es coactivamente, que es a través de la violencia, y la segunda es discursivamente, que es a través de la palabra. Entonces, este segundo, esta segunda manera de ejercer control, este atropello, no es tan fácil de percibir como el primero, porque no es físico, o sea, no se puede ver, es a través de la palabra. Este, sin embargo, es mucho más alarmante porque pueden controlar nuestra manera de pensar y, por consiguiente, nuestras acciones. Entonces, okay. a través del discurso se pueden construir los modelos mentales y los modelos mentales son este, los constructos o nuestro conocimiento social. 
que también, o sea, personal y social. Cómo nosotros entendemos y percibimos los eventos y situaciones de nuestro entorno. Y a través de los modelos mentales, nosotros categorizamos nuestras experiencias. Y al categorizar nuestras experiencias, también le otorgamos opiniones y emociones. Entonces, al controlar cómo nosotros entendemos el mundo, también puede encontrar cómo nosotros eh, nos comportamos en ciertos contextos o en ciertos entornos, como en los modelos contextuales, que imponen los parámetros del lenguaje a partir de nuestro entorno. Por ejemplo, la de Ixis. Si yo estoy aquí, me puedo decir esta silla en lugar de esa silla. Pero si yo cambio, mi entorno, mi contexto cambia, entonces si estoy allá, puedo decir esta silla en lugar de esa. Y aquí diría esa silla. Entonces, si pueden controlar, aunque los modelos mentales son individuales, también hay creencias que compartimos con nuestra sociedad, con los miembros de nuestra sociedad. Este, y pueden convertirse en representaciones sociales de ciertos grupos o lo que nosotras queremos o estamos tratando de trabajar de la manera en que nosotros nos alimentamos. O sea, hay ciertas representaciones como la norma alimentaria, pues nosotros nos debemos alimentar de cierta manera. Y las representaciones sociales pueden luego convertirse en ideologías. Como estas representaciones sociales, si las utilizamos como fundamentales para no, fundamento, o son principales para nosotros entender el mundo, pues ahí ya entonces serían ideologías. Entonces, aquí en lugar de un postura, sería una postura académica crítica y comprometida. El análisis del discurso tiene cuatro componentes básicos, que sería la descripción del problema, el análisis del problema, una crítica al problema. Hay que proponer cómo estos grupos que están siendo dominados, cómo pueden parar de ser dominados. Y el análisis del discurso también tiene un compromiso con estos grupos que están siendo dominados, porque no es solo describir y analizar y criticar, sino ayudarlos a salirse de esa dominación. Entonces, el corpus... Pues aquí unos ejemplos del corpus, aquí vemos más que todo en las bebidas cómo promueven mucha la lactosa, entonces tenemos como... Ah, ok, perdón. <risa> eh, la lactosa como, eh, pues ahí lo de Happy Cows y entonces todo este anuncio de Gut Milk que de verdad no hay ningún eh, sustento que diga que la leche de verdad la necesitas para poder vivir. Entonces también es una dieta bien cargada en carne, sobre todo en carne roja y entonces vemos anuncios como, eh, pues, eh, por ejemplo, eh, The Thing You Want... When you order a salad. Entonces tenemos todo este discurso de que lo, eso es lo que tú de verdad necesitas comer y esto es lo que vemos como comida, un, como carne roja, lo que necesitamos. Entonces vemos cosas que son quizás más naturales para nosotros, como por ejemplo eh, vegetales que nosotros mismos podemos cultivar o frutas que podemos cultivar. Y entonces eso nosotros no lo percibimos como una comida o como algo saludable, como suficiente. Y pues también podemos ver cómo... Eh, buscamos todos estos alimentos todo el año, en vez de darnos cuenta que los alimentos también van por temporada y que cada temporada tiene un alimento específico que tenemos que cultivar, que va a la par con el ciclo de la naturaleza y pues con nosotros mismos y pues como también podemos verlo en otros como Burger King, McDonald's, eh, Pizza Hut, son todas estas comidas que de verdad no tienen mucho valor nutricional, pero que nosotros lo percibimos de esa manera y eso es lo que le damos a, pues, a nuestros familiares, a nuestros hijos y pensamos que estábamos haciendo bien si, sin de verdad verificar. Y entonces vemos a gente que depende más de quizá eh, los vegetales y las viandas, y entonces eso lo vemos como algo que no puede ser suficiente o no saludable, y pues esa dinámica de que percibimos como bien y mal sin de verdad estudiarlo más. Entonces nuestra predicción es que la representación mediática de la norma alimentaria influye en la sostenibilidad alimentaria de Puerto Rico, o sea, que si nosotros pensamos que la tierra no es suficiente, pues entonces no vamos a trabajarla y vamos a mantener esta inseguridad alimentaria, como pasó con el huracán María, no muchas personas pudieron entrar porque los puertos estaban cerrados y si hubiésemos tenido, hubiésemos trabajado usado nuestra tierra, hubiésemos podido encontrar el alimento ahí y no muchas personas hubiesen este, pasado hambre.
Nada, y nuestra referencia. Y ya, se acabó. Thank you. Gracias. Okay, time for questions. Any questions from the audience for any one of these four presentations? This one here. Uh, uh. <laughs> Unos comentarios a la, a la última presentación que comentaron que la figura del jíbaro en los 50, o sea, sí, Muñoz Marín adopta esta figura, pero la tenemos desde mucho antes, en los 1849, con Manuel Alonso en la literatura, y que luego en los 30 vamos a ver que se retoma esta figura literaria dentro de, de la producción de textos en, 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 en Puerto Rico, y que por eso luego hace un empate acá con ¿Cuáles son las marcas que más vienen a Puerto Rico y quiénes son las personas que compran estos productos y de dónde vienen, etcétera, y qué, y qué tanto valor alimentario tienen? Y, y bueno, y su relación con los cupones, porque cuáles son los que se permiten comprar o cuáles son los más accesibles en un supermercado. Y la, entonces la relación con, hasta cierto punto, la clase. Como en una sección geográfica tú podrías ir, que cómo es la clase en este sector, y qué productos tienen más accesibles en ese supermercado comparado con otro supermercado en otra área más adinerada, tal vez. Okay, so la, different dimensions to your study. Please come here to to um, to reply. But for those people who are listening uh, in the uh, virtual audience, the question was about how to deepen the historical uh, analysis around uh, uh, the discourse around food in Puerto Rico, and also. Uh, Uh, the accessibility of f healthy food in Puerto Rico, especially what can be bought with food coupons or uh, in stores that may not be located in the most um, affluent areas of the island. Eh, pues la relación con los cupones sería algo bien interesante para estudiar porque hasta cuando vivo fe, vino FEMA, uno de los paquetes eran cosas que no eran claramente muy saludables y pues estuviera interesante ver la relación entre qué es permitido eh, adquirir a través de los cupones y en relación con el Jíbaro lo mencioné específicamente en los 1950 porque el Partido Popular sí utilizó esa figura para como acoger a estos puertorriqueños que estaban afuera de Puerto Rico también y decirle como que, pues, eh, recuérdate de este jíbaro, que sabes tú estás más o menos luchando por él y está ahí, está triste, está deprimido, pues tú tienes que seguir adelante y es como para hacerlo sentir un poco mejor a ellos mismos del hecho de que tuvieron básicamente que sacar, forzar a esta gente afuera de Puerto Rico y pues... En Paz entonces también se desarrolló, por ejemplo, la calandria, que también ella era como que una figura que representaba el puertorriqueño y todo ese discurso que también pues jugó una gran parte en el Partido Popular para los años 1950 y por eso se mencionó específicamente para ese año. Pero, gracias. Más preguntas. Question for um, both uh, uh, Ana and Isa. Uh, have you heard of Tonquas, the, the magazine Tonquas? Yes, and the, the original idea of Tonquas. Words from the flow of your presentation create natural segues from one slide to the other so that for the audience... <laughs> okay, the idea of Tonquas was to promote this whole idea of inter lingualism and uh, sometimes I have a problem with the word translingualism but that's my own uh, uneducated uh, take on it interlingualism so tongues and linguas so the, it was the students themselves who came up with the name tongues and in the magazine it's Spanglish it's English it's French it's all the languages that probably if you trace the cultural mix of Puerto Rico Some of those languages may have almost disappeared, but if you look at the names of Puerto Ricans, you have the French names, the German names, the Spanish names. So for me, uh, Tonguas is one of the student magazines 
published in the English department, Faculty of Humanities, that your research could also add to the other uh, journal. And uh, the idea of uh, uh, bilingualism, what about uh, intercultural or transculturalism also as one of the foundations for the study of translingualism? Because I've not heard any mention of the multiple cultures that form the language situations in Puerto Rico. Okay, so basically for our audience, uh, virtual audience, the question was about the different publications that have uh, attempted to incorporate translanguaging uh, and um, also uh, the cultural aspect. Thank you. Hi. Um, well, I have heard of Tonguas before, and I've never had the opportunity to actually read the magazine. That's why I didn't include it as one of the examples, but I have heard of it. And I've, from this, what it sounds like, it would definitely be another good example of how we are uh, promoting diverse language ideologies. And in regards to the other portion of the question, well, like I mentioned, I only talked about English and Spanish in my presentation because that's what I'm familiar with. I, those are the only two languages I speak and that's why I chose to focus on those because that's just my context. But like I said, this could apply to as many languages as you speak, two, three, four, five. It doesn't necessarily just have to be between two languages and it doesn't necessarily have to be just English and Spanish. It could be any combination, okay? Anna, I don't know if you want to add anything. Anna. Well, in regard to the first comment, I haven't actually read that magazine. Um, Itza and I are from UPRM. And over there, they have a, a literary magazine called Savanas. And that one is also a bilingual magazine. So these are some of the things that are coming out that are starting to accept that we have to stray from these monolingual ideologies. Um, regarding the... Um, other question, what was the other question? <laughs> oh, um, definitely I think that these ideologies uh, about language are interconnected with ideologies about culture and that's why in my study I'm studying um, languagelessness and bicultural ambivalence because I think that the phenomena go hand in hand. The reasons why we're considered um, deficient in both of our languages go hand in hand with us being considered deficient in both of our cultures. Um, so I think that these are phenomena are phenomena that need to be studied together, culture and language in Puerto Rico and in other countries like Itza said. More questions? More questions? La que está hablando ahora, creo que su nombre es uh, Ana Tubens. Eh, usted era la que estaba hablando de las leyes en Puerto Rico de bilingüismo. Hay un, hay un artículo de la revista de estudios hispánicos de la edición del 2000 y aparece ahí, está dedicado todo a lingüística, la lingüística en términos generales, pero específicamente la puertorriqueña o temas basados en Puerto Rico y la doctora María Vaqueros hace un recuento de, la, de cómo evolucionó la, la ley del bilingüismo por llamarlo así en Puerto Rico solo para eh, como a manera de observación ya en 1920 y tanto se había aprobado la ley para que se educaran los, estu los y las estudiantes en español pero solamente en escuela primaria entonces luego en el 49 es que se aprueba la ley español para escuelas secundarias. Entonces, eso es solamente una observación. Para las compañeras Michelle y la tocaya Gabriela, gracias por la presentación. Esta mañana estuvieron aquí del, de la, el recinto universitario de Utuado, una excelente participación que hubo y ellos básicamente presentaron métodos sustentables, esta palabra no me sale, eh, para trabajar con la agricultura, entonces hubiera sido perfecto que ustedes dos estuvieran ahí para que de alguna forma pues se comiencen a crear alianzas, pues como ustedes muy bien lo, lo señalaron, eh, Bandic, el cuarto aspecto de su acercamiento es el compromiso, ¿verdad? Y con eso las dejo porque ustedes tienen las manos bien llenas en ese aspecto del compromiso, gracias. Ok, um, I have a question for Jacqueline. Okay, so basically, 
there's a whole tradition here. Um, and also your study of it is, is I think, uh, giving us a, no, a new insight into it of the connection between music and, and, and protest. Now I think Puerto Rico finds itself in a new era, as you said. I mean, we are experiencing now a level of neocolonialism that's unprecedented, really. Um, where do you think it's leading? And then what can you do as a, as a, as a researcher to actually try to unpack it? Thank you very much for the question. Um, I think that to answer what I would see as your first part, as us being a neo-colony, um, where we're going, if I were to get into detail of, of at least where I think we're headed, um, I don't think that it would be very appropriate. But I, I, I think that um, definitely we've seen better times. Um, you know, it's 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 a struggle because I I don't know I I as a as a young person I've had the opportunity to speak with people that um, were born um, before Operation Bootstrap and so like I I hear about all of these things and then you know I've read you know these texts like Esmeralda Santiago when I was Puerto Rican before electricity and and there's this comparable you know th there's these two evils so we had you know, um, rice with um, worms in it, and you, you would have children, like, having things come out of their bums, you know? But then you have, like, this new reality that we have where um, children are not receiving an education, um, the salaries are getting cut, the benefits are getting cut, and I think that it's a forced exile and that they want the people that stay to be the ones that have no way of escape. And if you have uneducated people, you can control them. Uh, that sounds terrible, but I think that that's you know where we're going. And I, I think that at least for me, what I what I as a researcher would like to do, um, and it's been my goal since I started to study, is to educate the people outside of the island. Um, I write uh, creatively in English, and I try to reach people out, outside of here. Um, I'm also, I'm an educator as well, and I try to have my students um, learn a lot of, about the literature of the Caribbean. Uh, Kamau Brathwaite, um, in his article, his, in his essay, History of the Voice, he talks about how in school we learn the literature of the oppressor. And so I think that if we can try to create a new generation of people that have a literature that's their own and they embrace that, maybe we can change people. So that's my... <laughs> I don't know if that a big round of applause for this group. Uh, now I would like to invite the next group of speakers to come. That's Petra Barreras, Hilda Silva, um, Ari Alana Hernandez, Sherian Shehada, uh, Danaban Kuabong, and Alexandra uh, Martinez Canavate, please. Work on the flow of your presence. Please uh, come up to the stage. Come up to the stage, please. Don't be afraid. Yes, please uh, come. Be uh, feel free. Come up to the stage. Okay, the first one. Is Ari here? I'm here. Okay, great. There's going to be a slight change in the order, a slight change in the order. So the, uh, instead of speakers number th on 13 being first, we're going to have actually speaker 14 first. So um, our first speaker will be Ari Alana Hernandez, and uh, she's going to be talking about fantastic spaces in the tall shadow by Mailing Team. To change the slide, you just press this one and try to speak into both, because this is for the people who are at home, and this is for the people who are here, because we have a, we, it's being broadcast telecast too. And to change, I mean, to extend your thing down, you just press this and it'll 
So do I have to do it as I'm okay, reading? Okay, so to go down. Oops. Okay. So let's see. If you want to do it step by step, otherwise, if you want the whole thing to be. Because I just wanted the just information want one to be up okay. while I was reading. That was all I wanted. That one. Do you want everything up there? Just that one. Just uh. J yeah, that one. Just uh, which one? The inf all right, of that. All that's right. All That's just I Good. wanted. Okay. So that way, while I'm reading, that yep. information's up. That's it. Yeah. That's great. That's perfect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. The Guyanese storyteller Mei Ling Jin uses her short story, a, Sh a Tall Shadow, as a tool with which to explore some of the issues that limit the lives of female characters in the multicultural Caribbean. This story explores the complex interconnectedness of male-female dynamics within patriarchal cultures of the English-speaking Caribbean, focusing specifically on male dominance based on social class. Jin uses migration and marriage as symbols of the intersection of female desire and cultural determination. She presents the idea of diasporic migration and the dream of personal emigration as symbols for female freedom and self-expression juxtaposed to the sociocultural mechanisms of marriage, which negates the personal, physical, and social mobility of young women of the working classes. The house is another symbol used by Jin. Traditionally, the house is interpreted as a domestic female space. In this story, it is a place where a powerful male character tries to impose gendered roles upon the female protagonist, expecting total obedience. Therefore, the house symbolizes domestic violence, but the owner of the house, the house itself, and the space encapsulated within it present an alternate narrative zone in which to explore the nature of violent male dominance. This narrative zone we shall call the fantastic. In A Tall Shadow, Jin uses the dream of emigration as a symbol for personal female liberation from culturally imposed gender roles. Emigration often presents Caribbean women with options that do not exist in their small nations. It promises freedom in two areas. It is an escape from marriage or motherhood as the only roles for young women at the bottom of the social pyramid. And it is also seen as the path to a better life and escaping from poverty. Marilyn, the protagonist, is 19 years old. She is beautiful and of mixed racial ancestry. African, East Indian, and Arawak. She is also a market vendor who is, quote, tired of standing all day in the market selling roti, only to come home to join her mother in the kitchen to mix the roti, end quote, for the following day. As a young woman, she has only two worries. First, a suitor, the taxi driver Winston, who asked her to the dance on Saturday night and her desire to emigrate to New York to join her cousin, who had emigrated successfully. That day, Marilyn, quote, received a postcard with the words, greetings from the Big Apple on it. One day it was going to be her turn. Sandra had done it, and so could she, end quote. Marilyn is unaware that she has another suitor, an older man who symbolizes pervasive and persistent power. He is a retired judge from the county courthouse from a well-to-do family with a father who was a very good lawyer and a mother who owned land. He is an old East Indian man named Sultan with gray hair, large eyes, a hooked nose, and skin dark like oiled leather. His name, Sultan, as well as his profession are terms that denote power. Etymologically, Sultan comes from the Aramaic Shultana, meaning power, and the Arabic where it means sovereign. Sultan, the character, represents power in all possible ways, socioeconomic, judicial, cultural, patriarchal. And disturbingly, he also controls the powers of the supernatural, for he is also a sorcerer. The story begins with the display of Sultan's magical power. He creates a spirit, a jumbi, out of his own shadow and sends it to kidnap Marilyn. Sultan, quote, waited until the day was far advanced, then stood in the sun so his shadow would be at its longest. Raising his arms, he whispered, Ran Jai Pa, end quote, and sent his shadow running to kidnap her. Meanwhile, Marilyn was in her backyard after a long day at the market when she saw the jumbie appear. It was, quote, hovering 
as if waiting for her. Her heart skipped a beat. She stepped backwards and told it, me now want nothing to do with Jumbie. The shadow approached her, reached her, and Marilyn forgot and followed the shadow through the gate down the road. All she knew was the shadow, end quote, until she arrived at Sultan's secluded house where all the windows were shut to keep the shadows in. Once inside the house, Sultan's, quote, shadow returned to him, and Marilyn remembered her eyes adjusted to the light. She watched the old, mind, the old man, mindful of stories of jumbies. She asked, who is you? And he informed her of his intentions. He says, I've watched you. You sell roti in the market and clear $15 a day. I wanted to meet you. I need a wife. I like your stillness and your beauty. During the interactions between Marilyn and Sultan, the severity of their socioeconomic differences become manifest. It is obvious that he has the upper hand the entire ta time, for he is educated from a rich family, speaks standard English, and has worked professionally in the legal system. He also owns his own home, has money for traveling, and the luxuries of life. It is clear he has always lived a life of Caribbean privilege. While Marilyn is an illegitimate child who lives with her mother in a tiny one-room house with see-through floorboards and who has to fetch water in buckets whenever she wants to bathe. The biggest symbol of their inequality is precisely their actual knowledge of New York City. To Marilyn, it is a dream that, quote, could lift her out of this grinding poverty, out of this small, stinking world to go abroad, end quote. It is the perceived utopia, the American dream, the imagined land of milk and honey. To Sultan, it is a lived experience. He explains that, quote, the Big Apple is a big city, big buildings, cars, crime, poverty. People work their ass off in the shops, or worse, sell their tail on the street. You think the streets are paved with gold? No, streets paved with bodies, some dead, some alive. Sultan points out Marilyn's poverty in his effort to seduce her with his money. This made the girl feel, quote, naked. She saw her poverty as a stranger might see it, and she felt ashamed, end quote. Sultan, tr Sultan tries to tempt her by saying, if you married me, we could travel. I could help you get to the Big Apple. Tomorrow, if you like, I have plenty money. And Marilyn is marginally tempted, except that she feels dread at being touched by Sultan. Sadly, Sultan never sees Marilyn as a person. He never asks her permission or her mother's when he sent his tall shadow jumbie to kidnap her. All her. Like all pretty things in his home, she is an object he desires. His attempts to seduce her with money fail because in spite of her poverty, Marilyn is not materialistic. Since Sultan cannot see her personhood, he does not respect her requests. Marilyn explains to Sultan she has responsibilities. Quote, I left me mother and the roti just like that. Me mother going to be vexed. I gotta go now. Me mother going to kill me if I don't help she with the roti. Marilyn turns to leave, but Sultan is determined to keep her and he orders her like a dog. Stay. And something in his voice made her pause. Perhaps the ring of power in it. You can live here and enjoy my wealth. Have anything you like. I have more dollars than you can spend. Everything you need is here. Marilyn, still determined to go home, quote, considered the old man who looked frail but had powerful magic. She wondered, what was she facing? This old man, powerful. This old man inside and outside me mind, end quote. She tries to negotiate by saying, well, Sultan man, let me think. I can't up and marry just like that. I have to ask me mother. He tells her, no, no to think. Finally, Marilyn realizes she's trapped and tries to run for the door. But Sultan's magic shatters the girl's dreams. As she runs, he confuses her and she runs into a full length mirror that does not break. Instead, it absorbs her and she finds in herself inside the mirror aware that she has entered another layer of the supernatural. Often, fantastic stories are made up of three segments. The first movement occurs in intertextual reality. The second slides into the fantastic, and the third reestablishes intertextual normalcy. 
returning characters and readers to the normalcy of the first movement. That does not happen in this story. Instead, the characters remain within the fantastic sphere. Marilyn remains trapped inside the mirror where she will transform into a photograph that Sultan will put in a picture frame and place on his wall. Her dead essence will remain within the fantastic realm forever with her mother in the remote outside, unaware of what has happened to her daughter. Marilyn's disappearance echoes the story of millions of women who have disappeared throughout millennia at the hands of abusive males. Regardless of its fantastic nature, young Marilyn's disappearance attests to the sociobiological practice by which physical might makes the overpowering of those who are smaller a habitual occurrence. Mei Ling Jin's short narrative is a testimony to the lingering effects of patriarchal power over the female body. Marilyn was expected to submit unconditionally to a domineering, domineering male who erupted into her life, but she did not. Therefore, she pays and disappears into a dark netherworld. And although her death occurs inside the literary artifice of the fantastic and her disappearance is explained away as an act of magic, it is still at the hands of a powerful, wealthy Caribbean male whom she refused to obey. Thank you. Okay, our next speech, speaker is Sherian Shehada Hader. She'll be uh, talking about challenging masculine stereotypes and Raihan Shah's A Death in the Family. Good afternoon, I'm sorry for being late. <clears throat> challenging masculine stereotypes in Raihan Shah, A Death in the Family. While we are used to seeing the mother in the role of caregiver in the nuclear family, and while most fiction writing regards children as appendages to women, in a death in a family, in the family, Ryan Shah does an exceptional job of reversing patriarchal paradigms. She deals with an Indian Islamic culture and faith in a predominantly Christian and Hindu Guyana, where to be both a Muslim and a, wither, a widower can be challenging. In this compact novel, the reader is left to reconstruct from bits and pieces who Ahmad and Aisha were in real life. The work is compact in the sense that it heavily relies on monologues and uh, internal monologues due to the absence of the mother and father. Focusing on the premature maternal absence, we see how Ahmad assumes both roles, the mother and father of three children, coupled to an adamant resolution to stay single until his death. It cannot be denied that we are the creatures of our environment, thus factors as such as the socioeconomic system of Guyana, racial classifications, and religious backgrounds all intersect and shape Ahmad Ali's unacceptable position positions from the point of view of his family and in laws. In this presentation, my focus will be on questioning the positive aspects of Indo-Guyanese masculinity. That is, I aim to challenge the stereotypical representations of Caribbean Muslim men in relation to their roles in both public and family settings. For example, I will show how Muslims are not adverse to Western education for boys and girls. This novel is set in a short span of time that covers the death and funeral of Ahmad Ali, and it deals primarily with kinship and the complexities born out of familial relationships. The narration begins by forcefully including readers in the condemnation of the principal character, Ahmad, who seems to be responsible for everybody's 
unhappiness, be it that of his dead wife, Aisha, his children, or his in-laws. However, as the narration progresses, things rightfully fall into place and eventually Ahmad is abs absolved of all acrimony harbored against him before and after his death, thus involving the reader in an emotional conundrum. Only death grants him a silence to be gradually reconciled with by his children. Aisha's untimely death helps uh, as well to eliminate the perplex were of a death in the family, leaving behind three orphans, Mariam, Khalil, and toddler D gives rise to an exceptional situation in the sense that it's usually a woman's responsibility to raise children, regardless of her civil status. In the novel, Aisha's absence takes its particular psychological toll on each character with constant weeping, relationship insecurity, and grudges all symptomatic of open psychological wounds. It couldn't be argued that, and I quote, the death of a mother compromises her immature children's survival because children require postnatal care, end of quote. While this maternal care has been eliminated from the lives of Aisha's children, Ali attempts to compensate to some degree in terms of, I, and I quote, affection, protection, and education, end of quote. It is limply inferred in the novel that at some point in her life, Aisha wanted to be a teacher, along with her sister Hamida. However, due to marriage and domestic commitments, this aspiration came to dead end. During the post-independence period, women were given more autonomy and independence, allowing some to break out of the traditional colonial domestic roles, as did some of Aisha's siblings. Women, women have also played more active roles as female heads of households, both creating a space for individual independence as well as strengthening their kinship relations. Men subconsciously fear a woman's independence and patriarchy always tries to relegate female subjects to domestic roles. This enhances our understanding of Aisha and I quote, it is a fact that many a young woman in the Caribbean has deliberately stifled any pretensions to a career, lest in so doing she outshine her male counterpart and thereby end up an old maid, end of quote. If we are to follow this line of reasoning and apply it to Aisha, it becomes clear that she decides to marry Ahmad as the socially more acceptable option to staying single with money and a career. Subjects are born of their surroundings and Caribbean societies have inscribed colonial versions of patriarchy in the psyche of the people of the region. And I quote, the ideology of masculinity and femininity in Guyana entails that the man be the breadwinner and the woman the caregiver. This ideology is the legacy of the Anglo-Protestant colonialists, end of quote. Turning to Ahmad Ali, throughout the story, he is accused of ruining his children's lives. Readers can see that raising three children alone is it an easy task at all for either gender, but Ahmad doesn't hesitate for a second to take care of his orphan children despite the fact that he is a Muslim and thus belongs to a community where this role is less accepted for a man than in others. The political turmoil and unrest that characterizes Guyana in this period makes child rearing even more challenging. All of these factors serve to further complicate the already complicated life of Ahmad and his motherless children. The political situation in Guyana, described as a heap of garbage in the novel, leaves no doubt on the part of the reader of the anxieties harbored by Guyanese parents in relation to the well-being of their children. Questions of what and where children study become crucial in this case, and Ahmad doesn't hesitate to send his children, Khalil and Di, abroad for their studies. Thus states that the following, Guyana, formerly British Guyana, is an Anglophone country in South America, which identifies politically, culturally, and historically with the Caribbean. It is currently in the process of restructuring its highly in-depth economy through a 
structural uh, adjustment program, the political and economic problems the country has faced have led to massive emigration and the flight of the educated mi middle class, end of quote. So Guyana was colonized by the British and since independence in 1966, it has undergone many difficult and chaotic structural and cultural changes that have negatively affected both the Indo-Guyanese and Afro-Guyanese communities. Each of these communities has organized ethnically based parties which have waged fierce fights with each other over political eth uh, <coughs> sovereignty. In the novel, this is well documented in passages such as the following. Hasib and Hussein were busy with plans to emigrate to America. It was that everyone was doing what everyone was doing. Everyone was escaping the future, the bleak future that the country offered. There had been disturbances and racial riots as the United States and Britain had colluded to remove the Indian political leader Chedi Jagan from government and place this rival, the African Forbes Burnham, into power. There was ethnic cleansing, the cleansing of the Indians. Such political unrest and economic instability do not constitute an optimal climate for child rearing. Thus, the reader wonders how can Ali raise and protect his children in such conditions? Massive immigration to industrialized countries is one way out of this predicament, at least for those who can afford to do so. In Hamida's words, and I quote, everyone lived like that, lived schizophrenic lives, one part in Guyana and the other in New York or Toronto or Miami. Every family was broken like that. It was unnatural and unhealthy. End of quote. Living in such a disturbing place and time gives any parent the right to send their children elsewhere. Guyana's unsettling political situation only one of a number of reasons that made Ahmad Ali's tasks in raising his children particularly ch challenging, being a member of an Hindu Muslim minority in a country where the majority are Hindus or Christians pose its own obstacles. Ahma Ahmad's Islamic upbringing obviously constrains him and the people who surround him arguably in more severe, uh, severe ways than in the case for any other group living in Guyana. His children see him as narrow-minded, and I quote, keeping to his narrow, confined world with its set rules and fear of damnation, end of quote which in reality reflects his particular fair, fair, uh, faith in Islam. The idea of clinging to the past, keeping ties alive with his homeland, and preserving his heritage is a recurrent theme throughout the novel, but, mostly, but most importantly, it is the foundation upon which Ahmad's character is built. Most of the characters condemn Ali as being old-fashioned because his way of thinking is focused on his vision of the past which represents for him a sense of safety and security, especially when his sense of stability is threatened by political and economic turmoil. Nobody stops and thinks that this bereaved father is doing his best with the culture that he received in his mother's lap. El Aswad states that mothers choose, and I quote, which elements of their original cultures they would like to keep, which they choose not to keep, and the extent to which they wish to incorporate with the new or other culture, end of quote. To some extent, however, Ahmad knew how to put his faith in its proper place, even though, as Price observes, and I quote, people who express greater religious, religiosity tend to hold more traditional ideas about women's status and gender roles, end of quote. In the end, Ahmad proves to be an open-minded father who wants the best for his children regardless of any political or religious affiliation. He is not opposed to these studying abroad and insists that Khalil should study in the States. He even allows Mariam to take over the business for a time. Yes, he has plans for his son to return to Guyana after finishing school as means for of passing down his name or heritage, which is very important to Ahmad. But these are normal expectations that parents, especially male parents, have of their children. In the case of Ahmad Ali, whose father had come to the new world seeking adventure, Ahmad had been entrusted with the responsibility to take care of the Ali name. People back 
in the ancestral homeland measure someone's uh, success abroad with two questions. What are your earnings and what have your children accomplished? More than once in the novel, these concerns are mentioned and, Allah, uh, and Ali frequently expect his children at different times to make me proud. Ahmad Ali's children eventually start to realize all the misunderstandings that they harbor against their father. They admit that, and I quote, he doesn't see himself that way. He doesn't want to change anyone's view of the word to his. He just wants to be left alone to carry on with his own, end of quote. His toughness on D, due to her breaking of tradition, his blessing of Maryam's wedding, and his buying of a house for Khalil all proved to be beneficial in the end. By the end of the novel, Maryam takes over the business and thus Ali's legacy is preserved. Khalil reconciles with his wife, Rina, and he marries a Hindu who converts to Islam. Though his death closes a sad chapter in the lives of Maryam, Khalil, and Dee, they finally heal of the wounds that have been caused by the lack of a mother's lap. As grown-ups, they finally reconcile their sorrowful past with their present so that they can move on in their lives. This fact is well expressed in the following lines, and I quote, how innocent the world was when you were a child. It was remarkable that it was the very same world all along and that it was you that changed and became aware of its complexities. And of quote, eventually they are able to identify with their father and to see that his actions arose from real concern as opposed to the controlling father cliche. He wasn't just a father figure, but also the spring of emotional support or reconstruction. Nobody can replace a mother's warmth, yet Ahmad Ali acted in the only way he knew out of love for his children. And in the end, his children were the ones who flourished. I quote, it was such a paradox, such a contradiction. Their father showed such kindness to people who were acquaintances, employees. It was as if the kindness were easier because he had no emotional attachment to them." End of quote. One of this novel's strong points is the fact that, just as his children, the reader finally comes to understand who Ahmad was. His constant melding into the lives of his children was his duty as a caring father. father. Some would see it as meddling because usually such interventions are accepted from the mother, but not from the father. Gradually, the image of the late Ahmad Ali, whom everybody accuses of having a hardened heart, vanishes, and instead we sympathize and remember that he was also a bereaved father who was left with three young children to raise alone, and he was well rewarded. His family thrives and prospers, while others like Hamida's children and Aisha's brothers leave their parents and the country for good, either because of Guyana's bad situation or simply due to the lack of family cohesiveness. Ahmad's children inherit a safe and secure home in Guyana, a sense of belonging to Muslim in the Guyanese community as they provide a proper fun funeral for their father. These were the values he wanted to pass down, and quite honestly, he did his job well. And I quote, he, Rakesh, thought that what nice children Mr. Ali had, and he thought that Mr. Ahmad Ali must have been a very proud man, end of quote. I conclude by asserting that a death in the family helps to a silence in Caribbean lit literary studies about the contribution of Caribbean Muslims, particularly because it challenges the negative assumptions and stereotypes about Muslim male behavior in Caribbean contexts. And this is the end. Thank you very much. OK, our next presentation is by Alexandra Martinez Canavate and uh, Dana Bancuabon. It's, in, it's titled uh, Spatial Liminalities, Repressed, Prolonged Grief Disorder, and Relationship Addictions in Jean Reis Wild Sargasso Sea and Miriam Warner Ve uh, Vieira's Jultain. Good afternoon. Um, I'm just going to speak for 30 seconds and uh, leave the podium for Alexandra to uh, do the rest. 
So uh, we, we studied these two novels from prolonged grief disorder, a type of PTSD uh, syndrome. And the idea is that the two uh, major characters in Wise I Guess C and Jules Tain suffer from these uh, syndromes. And because of that, they suffer certain uh, uh, deaths which are rooted in certain types of traumas. So Alexandra. Thank you. Um, let me begin here. So most readings of John Re uh, Jean Reese's White Targasso C and Miriam Warner Vieira's Joltain focus on the theme of psychopathology generated by identity confusions, cultural alienations, and gender violence against women. Valid as these readings are, we argue that they are nonetheless limited in their lack of engagement with post-colonial trauma theories to unpack latent and immediate causes of psycho-emotional disintegration and death of Jules Taine, Antoinette, and in both novels. Consequently, we engage in some of the post these post-colonial trauma theories that deal with repressed prolonged grief disorder, which is a form of PTSD resulting from unhealed historical memories from slavery, poverty, ethnic, and cultural marginalization, together with spatial liminality and uh, relationship addictions to explore the psychopathologies of both heroines. We show how these, bo uh, how these undiagnosed traumas caused by grief, Caribbean historical and generational psycho-emotional and social fragmentations, feelings of abandonment, and obsessive romantic identifications with racial, geographic, and cultural imageries of blackness and whiteness through marri marriage, together with social and gender problems, destroy the life of the heroines. In Jewel Tain, we discuss the loss of loved ones, parents, godmother, husband, and pregnancy as traumatizing. Her parents die when she is very young, uh, then she replaces her parents with her godmother, then her godmother passes away when she goes to college. She replaces him, uh, her with her husband, and she becomes pregnant only to lose the pregnancy in a very traumatic, traumatic way. Uh, Joltain suffers of an inability to mourn losses. She does not accept what is happening to her, and she instead represses it, and that comes back in madness. So. Uh, she has feelings of abandonment and rejection through the abandonment of her parents dying when she is young. We are too young to process at that age, so she immediately b sees it as an abandonment. And then when her grandmother, godmother passes away, uh, she marries, and this husband, she moves to Africa with him only to realize that he has been married once before. And it's a betrayal and at the same time, well, uh, rejection because he is already married. And then he marries once again. Um, uh, she's very, this causes obviously some sort of uh, personal insecurity and uh, desire for validation since no one has really uh, given her this sort of validation and since everyone that has been in her life in a way has left her. Um, we also discuss the cultural dislocation uh, here. In page 10, she says, I knew nothing about my own homeland. And I continue to quote later on on that page. From then on, I was almost completely cut off from my home island and from other young people my age. She leaves to France at a very, long, very, very young age. She's around 10. And in France, she is a black Caribbean woman. So she does not necessarily fit in the norms. And once she leaves to Africa, well, she's a, a Caribbean a woman that speaks French in Africa. So she thought that maybe once she arrived over there, things were going to, the people were going to accept her and they would understand her circumstances, but that wasn't necessarily what happened. Um, also, she has a social worker, Helen, who is also from the island of Guadalupe, who shows no interest in her, not even as a patient. Um, in the article, Reading Writing Women in Ju uh, Miriam Warner Vieira's Jewel Tain, uh, the, uh, the author pre presents the psychic disintegration caused by slave trade. The idea that colonizing countries such as France serve as a source of, so of culture and assimilation versus a perspective of Africa as a motherland Caribbeans are searching for. Joltain's black pride and how her family struggles with slavery makes her feel as if she belongs to Africa. 
Zoltan's madness is rooted in her repressed deterritorialization. Uh, she, f uh, she fights with racial and cultural disillusions uh, since she thought that she, uh, since she is black, she would be accepted in Senegalese culture. Uh, the Africans saw her as a colonizer, being that she's educated and she speaks French. She also does not have the will or the yearning to learn the native language, which alienates her entirely from the culture she's living in. Uh, continuing with White Sargasso Sea, Ant uh, Antoinette, the protagonist of White Sargasso Sea, is, uh, is a response to Emily Bronte's Jane Eyre. She is the mad woman that Rochester is married to. Jane Eyre is giving a voice to these Caribbean women that are only recognized for their madness. Um, so it takes place in Jamaica, where Antoinette is the daughter, the daughter of a plantation owner. And once the uh, abolition of slavery occurs, the plantation obviously loses most of its money and loses its slaves. Later on, um, the house is burned down by ex-slaves. And well, this obviously has an effect on her family and on her, she has to uh, accustom herself to living in other uh, privileges. So uh, she, f she suffers of parental abandonment. Her father commits, sui uh, commits suicide when she's very young and her mother never heals from that trauma. And then her brother dies and her mother does not heal from that trauma either. And the change in economic stance just destroys the family. Uh, her mother is placed in a uh, mental institution as a child so she cannot raise Antoinette. Uh, not that she would have. Uh, her mother rejects Antoinette from a very, very young age. She seems to not like Antoinette uh, ever since she's born. And then the relationship worsens when the house is burned down and Pierre dies, which is her little brother. On page 29, I quote, then it must be her. She looked at the door, then at me, then at the door again. I could not say he is dead, so I shook my head. But I am here, I'm here, I said, and she said no, quietly. Then no, 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 very loudly, and flung me away from her. Socially, the abolition of slavery makes the black community hate her family. And since they are Creole, they are not accepted neither by the European uh, community nor the black. Later on, her stepbrother gives her away to a psychotic Englishman, which is also uh, a horrible source of uh, abandonment and rejection. Um, because of this, uh, these rejections, she, searched for, she searches for recognition her, in her mother, but her mother obviously sends, uh, sends her away every time she tries. And then uh, her husband, Rochester, she tries to make him fall in love with her. And she even resorts to a love potion, which makes him uh, have brutal sex with her and leave her uh, injured and then have sex with the 13 or 14 year old help that works in her plantation while she listens. Um, we can see the cultural, social, and spatial di uh, dissonance uh, because Antoinette is not neither white nor black enough to be in any of the communities. And she also chooses not to be entirely Jamaican or English. Um, Andrew Nyonguesa says, these psychological problems are consequence of anomalies in identity formation process, which demands that ethnic identity precede hybridity for spatial uh, personality, page seven. Um, so, repressed, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Repressed prolonged grief disorders alongside the post-traumatic stress disorders and relationship addictions lead both protagonists to madness. Dultain and Antoinette struggle to find their identity and a culture in which they belong. The rejection and cultural dissonance they encounter once they, leave these, they live in these countries of their dreams eliminate the little humanity left in them. Oh, ah uh, yeah, in reading, writing, woman, in Miriam Warner Vieira's Tultane, Brodsky argues, she discounted the potential violence of that cultural encounter, never imagining that deterritorialization is an ongoing process of gain and loss, devaluation and revaluarization in relation to both fixed and changing terms of reverence, page 71. Antoinette and Tultane discover uh, deliverance through violence and destruction. Uh, Antoinette turns, uh, ends up uh, burning the house she lives in with herself inside. And Joltain ends up 
killing her husband's children and uh, pouring boiling oil on the third wife's face. If they had been able to find someone to listen empathically to their traumas, they would have, uh, they, uh, sorry, and to play the role of narrative witness in their stories, thus helping them to mourn their multiple losses, both Doltaine and Antoinette would probably have been able to begin a journey of, to healing. However, both novels show their wrong choices of coping, me coping mechanisms, especially their obsessive and romanticized desire for male acceptance in lieu of mourning, and the betrayal of su uh, betrayals both suffered in the blind pursuits of the illusion of happiness drive them to their deaths. And here are the references. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we're going to have a little change of equipment for the next presentation, so please bear with us. not going to get the sound. So, uh, yeah, we're going to have to do it without the clips, I guess, unfortunately. Um, there's, because this won't reach to there. Yeah. Entonces, oh. ella quiere, él necesita oh, sonido, pero no, el, el, la, la conexión está hasta allá. So. Cuando, cuando lo vaya de esto, suba el volumen y oh, le ponemos el micrófono mejor. No, vamos a poner el micrófono ah, aquí. Sí. Cuando sí. Lo sube, le sube el volumen bastante y le pone el micrófono cerca de la, cerca de la computadora donde esté. Está apagado este. Cuando vaya a encenderlo. Ok. Okay, so we're going to um, do our best with this next. Uh, what do you need? Okay, uh, our next presentation is by Petra Barreras uh, de Rio and uh, Hilda Silva Martinez. Um, it's entitled Filiberto, Una Historia Clandestina, uh, Musician and Revolutionary, a Critical Discourse Analysis. Um, I'm going to give it over to them now. I just um, want to say we're going to try our best as we can with the, uh, with the audios. And uh, uh, the sound may be a little complicated, but we'll, we'll do what we can. OK, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Farrakhlas. Buenas tardes. Filiberto Ojeda was the uh, leader of the Macheteros, a clandestine armed group of Puerto Ricans. Uh, who fought uh, against colonialism. He was posted on the most wanted list of the FBI for 15 years. 
in 2005, the FBI shot him in his home and let him bleed to death. A documentary of his life was released this year. Um, to review the documentary, we selected the Theory Critical Discourse Analysis, or CDA. We will talk about it briefly. We will also show two examples from the mass media, a news clip of President Trump and the official trailer of Filiberto as opposition to the discourse of domination. To end, Hilda will critique the documentary. Toyn van Dyke developed the theory over 40 years ago, the CDEA, and uh, the theory is about power and power abuse and how these are produced and reproduced by text and talk. It is a critique of dominant groups and institutions that create and maintain social inequality through communication and the use of language. CDA on masks binary thinking, us versus them. Us means white, patriarchal, economically powerful, Euro-American, and so on. Them means minus white, minus patriarchal, minus economically powerful, etc. Let's see devices that the dominant elites use um, in their discourse. No, no, todavía no. No. Okay. Yeah. If, um, I'm sorry. Okay. In attacks to immigrants, for instance, the police soldiers and civilians are patriots, as you can see in the blue. In, if others commit a violent act, they are terrorists. In the news we hear, police had to use force, but about them, we hear the crowd assaulted the police. Body language, smiles for certain groups, frowns for others. Let's find uh, some examples of these elements in Trump's discourse. Oops. Sorry. Let's check the connection with the internet because it's. I'm sorry, it was connected before, but it kind of like. No, okay. You don't need that. You already connected. So let's go back to the presentation. Let's go back to this. See if it works now. See, just click it. See if it. Oh yeah. Go to that. He will show up. Well, in any case, he did, uh, it's a clip where he says, if the caravan comes in and they are throwing stones, we will take that as firearms and we'll uh, shoot. I mean, he doesn't say in this clip in particular, but uh, that is the implication. So we'll continue. CDA exposes um, domination in its social and mental dimensions and representations. 
uh, the social representations in the mass media are so powerful that the members of the dominated groups begin to internalize them as mental representations. However, dominated groups also resist and oppose such domination through discourse. A great example is the change in words and the use of acronyms to describe the diversity of genders. We'll show the trailer from Filiberto, if we can. No. I can't believe it. Students. Huh? The microphone. This is a trailer, the official trailer for Filiberto, Una Historia Clandestina. It's a documentary. Check what the level of volume here. Uh, they just go to the speaker, click it in. Okay. What is it? An agent, a pawn of Cuba. Almost nobody survives a shootout with the FBI. And so there's a dick. Estaba dispuesto a entregarlo todo. This project uh, for the production of the film took around 12 years to be concluded um, because they confronted uh, several censorship from the government. Uh, the Film Commission had agreed to give them the same amount of money that um, Ivermedia was going to give them, but then at the last moment they retracted that offer. In November 14, 2011, they did the following statement, they gave the following statement. Proveerle financiamiento a este proyecto constituiría una evaluación a las secciones 2.01 y 7.04 de la ley 121 que prohíben específicamente el uso del fondo cinematográfico para financiar proyectos para propósitos particulares o que su propósito sea para propaganda político-partidista o sectaria. Okay. 
to avoid this, they had several requirements for the interviews. The people that they interview must have known personally Filiberto, and they must speak in first person singular. They also avoided uh, historians and analysts that would describe Filiberto from an outside point of view. Filiber the, at the beginning of the documentary, we see the young version of Filiberto, and he was a trumpet and trumpeter. Uh, they used the music of Jerry Medina, Filiberto's blues, through the film in several sections. First, as a transition between scenes, and then to give a new symbol, a new, yes, a new meaning to the symbol of a trumpet when it came to the scene of the attack and the Air Force planes in Base Muniz. In that particular moment, normally when we see or hear the sound of a trumpet related to the military, we think of a fallen soldier of, as an honor in them. But in this case, it's a symbol of victory, of victory because they accomplished something that was something they found that it was almost impossible to do, but they did it. Filiberto's views are seen as a terrorist, is represented as a terrorist and as a national hero. The movie leans more, or the documentary, leads more toward the national hero. They do this by demonstrating the contribution of Filiberto's music eh, to Puerto Rico through his music. Also, Filiberto's actions are presented as in favor of the liberation of Puerto Rico. He's also, after this, his death, is seen as an icon for the independence of Puerto Rico, which is one of the reasons that inspired the documentary in the first place, the reaction the people had toward his, after his death. This documentary goes with two stories at the same time. It tells the story of Filiberto, but it also has in the background the story of Puerto Rico's colonial status. Puerto Rico's colonial status influenced the actions of Filiberto, and they connect both stories at the end when they put the images of the national strike, the national strike of May 1st, 2017. During this moment, uh, during the scenes, the beauty of it is that we get to hear the speech of Filiberto of liberation and to f of fighting for rights of the Puerto Rican people. So going back to the statement of the film commission, did they have a propaganda when they wanted to build this film? Uh, and the answer is yes. However, their agenda is that if you want to have rights, you have to fight for them which is what Filiberto stood for, his life stood for. He fought for the liberation and the rise of the Puerto Rican people. Thank you. And this are some of our reference. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite all our presenters to come back onto the stage. Okay, question time, any questions? I pregunt us for any of the uh, four presenters or the four yes. presentations. Yes. Four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Um, just uh, thank you, you all. Thank you all, I should say. Gracias. Eh, la pregunta es para Petra y para Anita. I before we saw Michelle and Gabriela presenting the use of. CDA as a theory, and one of the aspects that they mention is commitment. So my question to you is, what's your commitment here? I mean, how, or how can we be, how can we be part of that job or mission that you're presenting to us? Okay, so for those of you who are listening uh, electronically to this, the question was about uh, the critical discourse analysis. There are three compo uh, four components of critical discourse analysis. The two first ones are the usual ones, but then there's a third one that's about uh, taking a critical point of view, and a fourth one 
that uh, involves engagement. It, you have to, as when you do a critical discourse analysis study, you have to figure out a way to engage with communities around the issue that you're um, addressing. So I think the question is, okay, how can you envision in the future taking this research that you're doing and use it to engage with the community? I think that's the question. Okay, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, well, in, in a way, we were showing what uh, Freddy Marrero did. Uh, he is a documentary um, filmmaker. He has done uh, the New York and basketball uh, recently. Maybe some of you saw that. And I think he, um, he doesn't know about this theory, but he did that. He took a step. He engaged, and he... Uh, produced uh, a, a documentary that is, I think, uh, pretty powerful. Uh, in terms of my commitment, uh, one of the things was to precise, precisely talk about it. And I'm hoping that perhaps uh, we can write something about it to publish as well, because he told me when I spoke to him, Freddy Marrero, that there were very few uh, um, uh, articles, um, there are some, but that the more the merrier. So that would be another way, another step in taking that. Is that yes. a good answer for you? Okay. Okay, um, uh, more questions? Yes. I have a question. Okay. I have a question for Ari. <laughs> Alexandra. I read uh, in uh, The Tall Shadow. Uh, are you considering using what is called ontology as a narrative uh, uh, trope? And uh, if, if you're going to do, do that, is it possible then to, from ontology, you talk of the Caribbean ghost story rather than the post colonial Caribbean Gothic as uh, theorized by? Uh, Lisbon Paravacine. So I have almost like two questions there. Okay, so the uh, first question was about ontology and how that would apply to this particular uh, um, research that uh, was done um, on uh, uh, Meline Jean's work. That's a wonderful question because I actually would like to do that when I go into the dissertation. So I do want to do that, but I don't want to do it yet. So I'm still staying with the fantastic and not going into the gothic yet. But the answer is yes, I do want to work with, the, with hauntology and then with the idea of the Caribbean as a space that is haunted by the past and by the violence that, that is there. Yeah. And this is part of a larger project which actually deals with um, this is a segment from a large, ooh, sorry, larger presentation. So it's two narratives. It's the narrative from a Nova documentary, and I got the title here. The other, that was the other story. It was called The First Face of America. So it, I compare the two stories, Maylene's story and then this documentary where they found a complete skeleton of a woman, young girl who was 13,000 years old. Um, in one of the caves in Mexico, and the, the paleo, I can't say the word, the paleoanthropologist was talking about how her body was broken. She had broken arms, her pelvis was deformed, and the amount of violence that had been perpetrated against the body of this 13-year-old girl. She'd been, she had obviously been forced into sex. Her pelvis was deformed from having had children too early. So you have this complete skeleton in a cave, and then it made me think about how the bones tell the story, and it's a story of violence against the female body, and how this young woman in Mexico is tied to the young woman in Guyana, because the documentary proves that the inhabitants of the Americas did come from Asia. So it all comes together. So yeah, that violence that just is there from the inception. Yeah. Does that answer? Uh, for Sherin. Okay, can you repeat the question for Sherin? Yeah. Sherin, uh, the question is, some people have argued that uh, in death of the family, 
the children of Muhammad all are traumatized by his strict uh, parenting practices, even though we can argue that he himself has not mourned the death of his wife and is not allowed to mourn by the sister in law who is so uh, constantly against him. And that because of that strict uh, parenting uh, practice that he engages in, he drives the children into uh, some kind of uh, uh, depression. Yet at his funeral, everybody pretends that he was such a wonderful father, he was such a wonderful man. How do you defend uh, that against your presentation? Okay, so for those who are listening uh, virtually to this, the question uh, for Sherian is uh, how uh, does she engage with people who uh, interpret this particular work in a very different way? That actually the behavior of the father um, causes uh, damage to the children? Well, you, 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 you professor, insist on asking us, so yes, I have to answer. <laughs> well, um, the novel, uh, I took it from the Muslim perspective. Now, there is the Muslim perspective versus the Western perspective, which uh, em uh, emphasizes on individuality. So any Westerner who reads that will uh, empathize or sympathize with the children because he's, uh, he will see that the father is interf interfering in, in his children's lives. Like, um, for example, uh, his uh, youngest daughter, Dee, she married a Hindu and he was against that because uh, he, um, a Muslim woman cannot marry from another religion. It should be like from Islam. So based on that, uh, when I read that story, I sympathized with the father because first of all, he lost his wife and uh, he was prevented from mourning that and uh, his in-laws, um, they uh, accused him. He was the reason behind her death. His children couldn't talk with him because they were angry uh, at his in, uh, of his interferings in, in their lives. So we can see this uh, conflict between West and the East, between Muslim and uh, non-Muslim, uh, yeah, interpretations. And well, uh, I saw it from my perspective and. I can, uh, I defend my uh, point of view. Is that? Uh, yes, that's that. Yeah. Uh, yes. My last question is uh, to uh, Alexandra. Thank you. Some people have read uh, the two novels as that uh, Jumutain and Antoinette are both victims of uh, the colonial and then anti-colonial discourses in the Caribbean in which one is the pursuit of whiteness as the ideal and the other is the pursuit of blackness. And both women get damaged because they are both pursuing these illusions of completeness. How do you respond to that? Rather than that they are marrying some bad men. So going back to the two novels of uh, Jultain and White Sokaso C, uh, uh, looking at the interpretation that um, Alexandra and Danaban give to it, how does that compare with other interpretation? Well, I have to agree because uh, first of all, it's true they are traumatized because they are not European, but also they're not black either. They live in that space in between. But also there's that idea that they're being sold that they have to return to their roots being it being European or it being Africa. So in a way, one of them is heading more to the anti-colonial, but even in Africa, she's not accepted. And then we have Antoinette, that even in England, she's not accepted. So that idea of either returning to your European roots, which would be, in this case, uh, colonial, it's still not accepted. It's not the right way to go. So it, they're both traumatized by either returning to their African or European. But it also has to do with the relationships. They do have very toxic relationships. And 
the fact that they are marrying into the cultures they want to be a part of also have to do, they, their husbands symbolize what they yearn for. So being their husbands or symbolizing the country they want to be a part of, either way they are affected by their colonial or anti-colonial stance. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. I think we have time for one last one, one last question. Anybody have a uh, question? Anybody here have a question for the other presenters? Okay, well, I, that's all we have time for, really. So our next uh, Caribe Plurilingue will, be, uh, will happen uh, in April of 2019. That will be the 12th Symposio Caribe Plurilingue. And uh, we're going to um, uh, invite you all to participate. So those of you who weren't able to participate uh, in this one, please uh, feel free to uh, send us an abstract for the next one. Let's give these presenters uh, another round of applause. And uh, we hope to see you next time. Okay, so uh, take care. And uh, uh, we hope that uh, uh, all of these presenters will take their work and uh, eventually publish uh, these papers. We have a way for you to publish with us. Uh, we publish two volumes every year. All of you who presented today, we welcome uh, you to take your presentations, convert them into uh, text, and we will uh, uh, consider them for publication uh, as well. Okay, thank you again. <laughs>